Good to see you this morning, here on the last Sunday of the month. Had a great services at our other campus today, and uh, the Lord really showed up, expecting the same things here as we get in the Word and we take, take care of business today, amen. I started this series last week called Taking Care of Business, and uh, continuing it today, but as we talk about this particular topic of business, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not talking in regard to your spiritual life uh, being business. I'm talking about, you know, uh, business in the context of the, of the affairs and the everyday things of our life, and especially starting with, as we started last Sunday, our walk with God. And the call that God has upon our life for us to be everything that He wants us to be. And not to miss that, because our relationship with our Heavenly Father is the foundation for everything we do in our life. And that's what Jesus talked about when He used the parable of the, of the two men, the builders. One built a house on the sand, and one built his house upon the rock. And the one who built his house upon the rock, his house stood firm. You have to build your life upon Jesus. And specifically, he put it this way, he who hears these words of mine and does them, that's the wise man. So it's knowing the word of God and doing the word of God. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who know about the Bible and they know bits and pieces and portions of Scripture, but they don't necessarily do the Bible. We're going to do some real practical teaching today on, in regard to doing the Bible and give you some real practical insights as to what the Bible says that we should be doing in context of the business of our life. So as we got into that last week, we, start, we dealt mostly with the whole idea of having a heart that was right, then out of a heart that's right, and a relationship with God that's right, then comes the things that in our, our life, they'll start getting in order. Today I'm going to talk about the money business part of our life. And uh, certainly that needs to be dealt with. The money's a very important thing in all of our lives. And if you don't think so, just leave yours here when you leave today. We'll take care of it for you. But it, it is important. It's an important factor about our life. And the Bible does have a lot, an incredible amount of verses of Scripture are given to this. And a lot of the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ is given to this issue about learning to manage what God puts in our hands and learning to be faithful with the blessings that He gives us and taking care. Well, the Bible calls it stewardship, being good stewards. Managers is what the word means of the things that God has given us. God has called us to be responsible in this area of our life. I heard the story uh, this week about uh, two men that were stranded on a desert island and uh, how they got there, whatever, a shipwreck, whatever. But they're on the desert island, and it's a little island. There's not much there, and it is a deserted island. It's got a couple of palm trees and not a whole lot left else beside that. Both the men are there on the island together. One of the men is completely relaxed, feet up, lying against a palm tree, the other guy's just freaking out. He doesn't know what to do. He's just beside himself. And he's just wondering, oh, there's no way we're going to get off the island. He goes on. He's just worried. What are we going to eat? How, how are we going to sustain ourselves? We're just, where's any fresh water? On and on the list went. He looks over at the other guy, and he's not worried at all. Just sitting there again, got to enjoy the day, enjoying the, the tropical breezes. He says, what is the matter with you, man? He responds, hey, I make $10,000 a week. The other guy said, well, so what, what does that mean? You, there are no banks here. You can't collect it. You, you're not, there's no stores here. That, and even if you had the money here, there's nothing to buy. You can't buy anything with it. So how can you be so calm? He said, let me finish. I make $10,000 a week, and I tithe. My pastor will find me. <laughs> <laughs> little backup support. My wife hates that joke. So I waited she was out of the room for a moment before I shared it. That's why the stall in the introduction. But uh, money is an important part of our lives. And the Bible does, no matter how you might try to twist the verses and talk about tithe and all those things, the Bible does speak consistently about proportional giving in our life. That we give a portion and we honor the Lord with a portion. And the Old Testament certainly gives us a standard of what that portion beginning should be when it talks about the tithe and 10%. Now, if you were a practicing Hebrew, that adds up to if you follow the tithing and what you're supposed to do and all the different feasts and everything, you'd end up giving about 33 and a third percent. But we understand a proportion of our giving should be honored uh, by giving it in honor to the Lord that we surrender. So I want to talk about this today. And by the way, I'm, I'm not going to take the scriptures out of context. If there's something that's a, a principle, it's going to be a clear principle through the Word of God. So we're going to look at what does the Bible have to say about this, this money business. I have the scriptures on the screen. You can read along or you can open up your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, which is just all about giving. 
And by the way, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is all about giving. So this is in context of being faithful stewards, and receiving offerings and giving offerings and those kind of things that the Bible is talking about here. Now the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church and he says, Now this I say, He who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness abides forever. Now he, speaking capital H, God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And you will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service of giving is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry that will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ, and they'll glorify God for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all, while they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace God in you. Now thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The apostle is talking about taking an offering for the suffering churches in Jerusalem and ministering to the needs there and ministering to the church, and he's telling them that, there's, you know, that they ought to respond. If you follow the context of both chapters, he gives an illustration about the Macedonians. When he went to Macedonia to give their offering, how, how that God moved and God blessed those people who were poor and couldn't give anything. They gave abundantly above whatever they, but beyond their expectations. They first gave themselves to the Lord and then they gave to this offering. So the Bible does have a lot to say about giving. But unfortunately, not a lot of people really understand the simple principles that are in the scripture from Genesis to the book of Revelation that God gives us in regard to this specific Bible promise. And I would ask you first as we get into this message to personally evaluate where you are in the context of your own gifts, in your own giving, in your own life. And just what part does this particular aspect of, uh, of, of being a giver what does that play into your real budget in life? And when you sit down and yearly as you propose what you're going to spend and what you're going to take in, you measure those things out, where does this fit? So what I want to do first of all is maybe just kind of do an evaluation with you and look at this evaluation and, and uh, put a check, box, uh, a check in the box by these particular statements if they reflect you or they reflect your life. The, the first one, it would say something like this, and maybe this is your life. My present giving is somewhat irregular. I tend to give most when the most powerful offering or the most powerful collection is taken, like when there's a building fund or a need for missions or something, that's when your most giving is. Maybe you fall in this category. It's important for me to have recognition for my giving. And there's some people like that. They want others to know that they gave it, and it's important to them. Some, I'd like to give more faithfully, and I have a hard desire to give more, but I just haven't followed through on my intentions. I really want to, but or, I tend to hold on to what I have. In an anticipation of future needs that may arise. So even when I'm aware of specific needs of others, I don't necessarily participate because, you know, there's no telling what tomorrow holds and I need to be prepared. Or maybe this is you. At least once every week I lay aside an amount of money to give according to the way God has blessed and directed me. Or maybe it's every other week as you get paid on 1st and 15th. Maybe that's the way it goes. But you try to respond in that kind of way as, as the Lord has blessed you. Another category would be that some people would say, well, I try to give in such a way is to minimize my own visibility so God can get the greatest amount of glory possible. Another might say, well, as, as far as I know, I've been giving everything that God wants me to give. And then there's this other person who says, you know, that uh, I, I'm willing to, to, to step out beyond that. I give as I need a rise, or I give as much as the Lord wants me to be. Or maybe you fall in the category of someone who just says, you know, I step out beyond the measure of myself. But all those, you know, kind of rec uh, uh, define somebody in the context of their giving. Some don't give it all, some, and they have a reason, I have needs, or I'm, what might happen tomorrow, or whatever it might be. And many times we just don't understand what the Bible has to say. But let me just start by saying, what is the expectation for our life? Now, what I'm going to cover today is some principles that I probably talk about at least once every year, because for those of you who are Christians, we always need to be reminded about what we're doing. For those of you who are new believers in Christ, 
or maybe you've been in a church in the past where the pastor just didn't talk about these things for whatever reason. Uh, we have a lot of pastors today who just don't have the spine to deal with some of these kind of issues, and they never get taught. And if, if you had a pastor who didn't teach you these principles, he didn't help you. The best thing that ever happened to me was to learn these biblical principles. But there's a lot of different ideas in regards, well, if I'm a righteous person, then, then, well, what does that mean for my life? Well, some preach today, you can turn on your TV and hear them, you know, righteousness equals riches. If you know, if you want to be rich, then you give, and it's, usually it's give to me, and God will make you rich, with that kind of thing that goes on. And, you know, God wants everybody to be rich, and God wants everybody to, uh, to, to drive the best car, wear the best clothes, live in the best house, have, you know, the best income. And that is being taught today, you know. In fact, the Bible talks about in the end times, false preachers would come and they would teach, you know, that godliness is gain. But it's not. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen? But So that's not the standard. Another say, well, the standard is really, and they go to the other end, righteousness. Hey, if you're going to be right with God, you've got to be poor. And they use that scripture, well, the love of money is the root of all evil, you know, why would some covet after they pierce them, erred from the faith and pierce himself. So what God wants to do is, is, to, is to, so you kind of live in a state of, a, of, of, of poverty. And if, the, if you're in poverty, then you're really, you can really experience humility, and then you can be righteous and you can walk with God. But that's not right either. But there is a standard, and I believe the standard is righteousness equals prosperity. Now, not prosperity in the materialistic mindset of the culture that we live in today. But let's put it this way. Righteousness equals biblical prosperity. And in fact, these scriptures we just read from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 <clears throat> give you a definition of what that means in chapter 9, verse 8. There's a description of biblical prosperity. God is able. Do you all know that, don't you? God is able to make all grace abound towards you. God said, I'm going to move on your behalf so that you always have all sufficiency in all things and that you may abound to every good work. Catch this. Look at those superlatives. Kind of put them in the yellow on the, on the overhead. It says, all and abound and always and all and all things abound in every good work. And those, those are some great words that God gives us to, to describe where our life ought to be. That we ought to always have, if we have a need, God, brings, God, God remedies the situation and gives supply to our need. In every situation, he says, I can make sure, and I'm a big enough God, to make sure that your needs are met. But isn't that the characteristics of any good father? And how much more so with our heavenly father? whose desire it is to meet every one of our needs. And I'm, I'm not talking about wants, because some of you want some things that really aren't needs, all right? So you can classify them according to genuine needs versus wants. But let me give you the, the Joe Orange definition of this. <clears throat> this means that God will give me what I need with enough left over to give back to needs and to ministry. That's as simple as I can put that scripture. And it is, it, is, it, is, it is as clear and in context and concise as, as we can possibly make it, other than to say that, hey, it makes a very clear statement about the ability of God to minister to the children that he has, that he loves, and that he's given his son for. God wants to meet your needs. And it might even surprise you that God will meet the needs of backsliders. You look at the children of Israel in the wilderness, 40 years they wandered around, and they never suffered hunger, and they never went without, and God, their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes didn't wear out, there was manna every morning, God met their needs, and boy, they were a messed up bunch of folks. Amen? So it's just within the context of the nature of God. In fact, I believe it's more of a miracle of God to not meet your needs than it is to meet your needs. Because for God to not meet your needs means that he's withholding for some specific reason. Let me get a cough drop out here. For some specific reason, he's withholding it to maybe to get your attention or to minister to you on some other level. But you follow Scripture, <coughs> it becomes clear that God wants us to give. God wants you to respond. God wants you to be a blessing. God wants you to minister to other people. God wants you to give. Look at these verses of Scripture. Proverbs 3, 9. <coughs> Excuse me. Is it warm in here or is it just me? We all think it's warm. Somebody help me out there. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, is what the scripture says. Honor the Lord from what he's given you <coughs> so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. He's talking about proportions. He's talking about take some of what God's blessed you with and give it. Proverbs 11. There's one who scatters, that means they give, and they increase all the more. And there's one who withholds what's justly due and only results in want. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs 19. 
One who's gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. So again, we get very clear here, if you follow the Lord, he wants his people to be giving people. Proverbs 28, he who gives to the poor. You're that kind of person that says, then you'll never want. And Malachi 3 is a passage that we shared last week. In Malachi 3, he talks about bringing the whole tithe to the storehouse. There may be meat in my house, says the Lord of heaven. You give, and God says, I, in fact, he even says, test me in this, try me in this, and see if I will not give back to you a blessing that you can't contain. The New Testament version of that verse is Luke 6, 38. Give. What will happen if I give? And by the way, that's not just a suggestion. That is a command in Scripture. Give. But it's a, it's, it's a command with a promise. Give and it will be given back to you. This is the same thing we just read those verses out of the Old Testament. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over. For by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Now all these point to the fact that it's very clear that God wants you to do something with what you've been given in your life. God wants you to respond with part of that. And if you follow the scriptures, it becomes very clear that this is his way for us, his children, to keep the flow of God meeting our needs coming into our lives. But there's so few people who grasp this simple principle, who understand these basic biblical truths. The problem is a lot of people still think that God works by magic. You know, that somehow just magic happens, and God's like the good fairy. And somehow it'll just, money will appear there, and it'll be all right. Even in Luke 6, 38, we just read, it says God will cause others to put into your lap. God will make others give to you. This is the way it works. But how do you trigger that? He said, you, you believe my word. In fact, this is the way God works. The principles that are laid out in Scripture. And this is why it's important. And this is why your pastor tells you week in and week out, read your Bible, study your Bible, understand your Bible, understand what God's made available to you. Second Peter puts it this way. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to, give me those next three words, to what? Life and godliness. God gives you everything you need for this life and, and to be godly. How did he do that? Well, through the knowledge of Jesus, of, of, who called us by his own glory and his, his excellence. God's, his son it brought us into a relationship with God. And then he's given us something. He has granted to us his precious and magnificent... Promises. What? Promises. And where do we find the promises? In the word of God. God has given us his word. God didn't give us magic dust and fairy dust. God gave us the truth. And God gave us his promises. And he says, if you, want to, if you want to have everything that pertains to life, to living, and everything you need to be godly, it's going to be found in this book. God's given us his promises. So that by them, you may become partakers of his divine nature. So how am I going to partake, participate in the life of God, and the nature of God? I'm going to do it through his word of God. Through his promises. And it's in his promises that I find out what I need. That's why we preach the Word of God. That's why we teach the Word of God. So we can experience the sufficiency of our Savior and our Lord, and so we can experience His life in us, and others as a result of Him working in us can experience that as well, because we flow out with what God has poured into our life. What are these promises? Well, let me just lay out five simple things. Now, I've covered these in one way or another over the years that we've had a church, and it's because we are, we are here today because we have believed these principles. And because for the most part, many of you have chosen to embrace these principles and you've, these are promises and these are the word of God. And you said, that's what God said. And I'm not going to try to understand it all. I'm just going to step out in faith and believe what God said. And these are principles that we've taught over the years in different ways, in different formats. But let me just make them real concise today in one sermon, give you five basic points to talk about the word of God and how it works in our life. First of all is what the Bible teaches called the principle of investment. Now the principle of investment means if I'm going to receive, I've got to do what? I've got to give. Back to 2 Corinthians 9. This I say, if you give sparingly, sow sparingly, you get. You reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, how do you reap? You reap bountifully. Galatians 6 puts it this way. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For, for he who sows to his flesh shall reap, flesh, reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit will also of the Spirit reap life everlasting. In fact, three times in this verse, he talks about sowing and reaping. The first verse, he's talking about sowing and reaping money. In this verse, he's talking about the acts and the deeds of your life and how you live your life. You're going to live after the Spirit or you're going to live after the flesh. And the principle is the same because it's the, the, the eternal 
principle from the Word of God we just call reaping and sowing, sowing and reaping. It's a principle of investment. Three times the Lord says in this one. In other words, if the farmer just looks at his field, there's not going to be a crop come up. He has to do something. He has to do what? He has to sow the seed. The most obvious, indispensable exercise of farming is this thing of putting seed in the ground so that there can be a crop produced as a result of the ground. If you want to reap, you have to sow. Sowing always precedes reaping. That's the simplest lesson of life and nature and also in Scripture. If you want a desirable harvest, you have to sow desirable seed, all right? Because you're going to sow the same kind of seed. There's a really, a really unique little parable in, in Mark chapter 4. This follows the parable of the sower of seeds. Jesus still using and teaching kingdom principles, this, this idea of investment. He says, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And then he goes to bed at night and gets up by day. And guess what happens? The seed sprouts and grows. How is the question. He himself doesn't know. The soil produces the crops by itself. First the blade, the head, the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts the sickle in because the harvest has come. God is trying to teach us a simple principle here. This man sowed the seed and the seed brought forth fruit. How did it do it? What did the man do? He just put the seed in the ground. How did he do it? Well, there's that little phrase that says, for the earth brings a harvest. And it says it like this in the King James, of the fruit of herself, the Greek term translated by itself, is the word automate. In the Greek language, we should know that's the word we get what from? The word automatic from. In other words, when you put the seed in the ground, something just automatically happens. It begins to work. The seed mixed with the soil, all that begins to take place together, and there's this activity, and says the farmer says, how does it work? I don't know. The seed and the ground working in, con in connection with the sowing process, something happens, it sows, and some, something happens that is automatic, and it's a harvest. Once the seed reaches the soil, the earth brings forth the harvest automatically. So simple principle number one. If you want to sow something, you've got to reap something. I mean, if you've got to reap, you reap something, you've got to sow something. If you don't sow, then you don't. It's that simple. Luke 6, 38, we read a while ago, give and it will be given. Give and it will be given. Now Jesus taught these principles. Not only in the context of, he's not just talking about seeds. These people were an agricultural, economic, I mean, world that he lived in and he preached to and he taught it. They understood you put seed in the ground and it brings forth fruit. He's making it clear and he's preaching through these parables many times on this issue of stewardship. Every farmer knows that, when, that, 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 that you put seed in the ground. In fact, sometimes there's a few seeds that don't grow, but it'll, they will be ultimately a part of the harvest. But if no seeds are sown, guess what? Nothing grows. When you see a harvest, it's a testimony that somebody planted something. When somebody goes out and the tractors are turning and the bushels are being put into the mills and the bins, hey, something happened, somebody did something. So they're reaping as a result of sowing. That's the principle of, of investment. The second principle is the principle of identity. Identity means I get what I sow. The kind of seed sown determines the kind of crop. If I plant corn, oats don't come up. If I plant corn, cotton doesn't come up. If I plant corn, what comes up? Corn comes up. So... It's this principle of identity. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, you know, that it's, it's whatever man says. But you can see this all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis made it very clear, you know, that in, in Scripture that, hey, every seed will bring forth fruit after its own kind. If an apple tree has seeds, then it's going to bring forth seeds. If a peach tree has seeds, then it's going to bring forth, uh, those seeds are planted, they'll bring forth peach trees after its own kind. So the idea here of identity is whatever a man sows, like Galatians 6, that's what a man will reap. In fact, the word whatever is a very unique term in, in, in the Greek language, which means whatever. <laughs> whatever. I didn't write this book. God wrote this book, and these principles are clear. In Galatians, he's obviously talking about you, you're going to live a sinful life, then you're going you're to have fruit that comes back to that. In other words, you can't go out and sow wild oats and expect a crop failure or expect good fruit to come up. What's going to come up is the, is the fruit of all the wild oats that you sowed. 
So you reap what you sow. It, it, it has to do with identity here. It's corn, it's corn. It's peas, you get peas. If, if you sow hatred, guess what you get back in your life. If you sow love in your life, guess what you get back. Friendship, guess what you get back. The Bible says if you want to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. Why? Because you reap what you sow. So it's a simple principle here. To reap, you must sow. Second point is, you're going to reap whatever it is that you have been sowing. The third principle is the principle of increase. That means that I, I get more than I sow. In fact, the proportion of, of, of crops is usually much larger than the seed sown. In the biblical illustrations, you have a man that goes out and sows some seed, and obviously what comes up, the Bible says, is some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100 times. One seed can bring forth 100 times what was sown. But whatever it is, it will bring forth, and it will bring forth more than what you have sown. A sack of seed can produce a whole bushel of grain. In fact, Jesus made that clear in the parable of the Southern Seeds. In Luke 6, 38 again, let's just repeat it. Given it will be given to you. How's it going to be given to you? It's going to be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they'll pour into your lap. For the standard of measure that you measure, you'll be measured to you in return. In other words, the farmer sows a few seeds, he gets a larger crop. The more seeds he sows, the bigger the crop it is. And it's always much proportionally larger. In fact, this illustration of using the farmer and this, the idea of him sowing seeds has two points. There's a negative spot and a place in it, and there's kind of a, a, a positive point in it as well. The, the negative is this. It emphasizes the truth. When, when you make it a habit to give only a little, really all you should expect back is a little more. But when you sow a lot, then you should really expect back a lot. Why? Because you're greedy? No, because that's what the Bible teaches. You give a little, you get a little more. You give a lot, you get a lot more. You sow with a little spoon size amount, you get a, maybe a tablespoon size back or maybe a spatula full or something. But you sow a lot, a shovel load, you're going to get shovels back. So it depends on how you sow it here. It also says not just the negative, but there is a positive context. And that, that's, that's that there's greater rewards for those who are willing to habitually give more and make a practice of giving more. But if you fail to do that, I mean, you know, the proportionate quantity is not going to be what you would probably perhaps desire to see it be. It's just not going to be there. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 again. He who sows what? Sparingly. Reap sparingly. You sow bountifully. You reap bountifully. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned this principle, the inaction of, of investment. You're going to have to you reap, you sow. You want to sow, you have to reap. Number two, we've learned you reap what you sow. And now we've learned that you reap more than you sow. Are you still with me? Pretty simple, isn't it? And praise God for the simplicity of Scripture. The fourth principle is this. It's called the principle of interval. I get later than I sow, basically. He shall reap, the Scripture says, all right? He shall reap bountifully, he shall reap bountifully. Always speaks of the future, this, this, this tense of the, of the verb here. In other words, you don't see an immediate return. It's not like I'm going to give this money, boom, there it is. You don't always see immediate return. So you stay in the process of honoring God, and, and you stay in the process of planting seeds and laboring. For those of you who are in sales, perhaps, you've heard a term called loading the pipe or feeding the pipe. If you're in sales, this is, if you want to be successful in sales, this is what you learn to do. You always have to be putting it, if you want something out the other end of that pipe, your supply to come out, meeting your needs, then you always have to be pitching. You always have to be selling. You always have to be working. There's, there's, you just don't kind of pitch one and hope it's all done. No, you, you sow bountifully. And if you do that, in time, through the interval process, guess what starts coming out? But you want to keep the pipe loaded so it continues to fill. So you don't just quit working. You don't just quit selling. You don't just quit, so Scripture says, sowing. So loading the pipe is, is something that we should understand in our Christian life. We don't always get it immediately. Sometimes it, it happens immediately, but most of the time there's this interval. So you can be sure that there will be a harvest. You can be sure it's always sure. It's not always speedy, but you can mark it down according to Scripture that you'll see a harvest. And some people have a tr trouble with this. Some people have trouble because of greed. They just want more, and they're materialistic. Some people have trouble with this because they're afraid, all right? And are, are maybe they're a covetous person. You say, well, I just don't want everything, Pastor. I just want more, you know? <laughs> that, that's the kind of category they fall into. And so they're, they're, they're not habitual in, in, in this regard in their life, and they're, they're really hesitant. And, and some people just say, well, you know, Pastor, I, I just cannot sow for whatever reason. You know, I, I can't, I, I know to reap you must sow, but I, I, just, I, I just 
I just don't, I, I just have a problem here. And, and maybe they gave one time and the, the interval didn't happen. But you're going you're to have to sow before you can reap. And if you will reap, you, you will reap what you sow. And not only that, you're going to reap more than you sow, but you, you reap later than you sow. Do not let unbelief. And you say, what do you mean unbelief? Unbelief shows up in the form of fear or doubt. I, mean, I know what the Bible says, but I'm not really sure that'll work. It's amazing. You know, the banker can advertise it. He'll give you maybe 1.5% on your CD, which is pretty, you know, favorable these days if you get that. You know, put some money in your bank or, or you have one of these investment banking accounts, you know, checking accounts that re- earns money while you got it in there. And they say, we'll give you a half point or, you know, or three quarters of a point or something while it's in there. That's pretty cheesy. You know, but how many people jump on it? Oh, I got some money from my money. I can put it in there and buy it in my checking account. I can, if I got this much balance, I'm going to make, you know, point of a point, you know, a little percentage of a point. And they're all excited. Hey, who told you that you would earn that? Well, the banker did, so I put it in there. So the banker says, if you'll put in a lot of money, I'll give you a little bit back. A little tiny bit back. But, sorry, inflation is going to take most of that anyway. So. But you're going to get a little back. But God says, you put in a little, I'll give you a little more than that back. In fact, God says, you put in more. You put in a lot like you put in the bank. I'll put in a lot more in your pocket. Why can't we have trouble with that? It's unbelief. It's unbelief. We don't really realize the validity of the living word of God. Can I really trust God? Sometimes we're so anxious. We're willing to wait on a banker, but not wait on God. The fifth and the last principle is the principle of intention. I call it the law of labor. You know, the law of labor says, you know, I must sow. Now we know that you're going to reap what you sow. Made that first point very clear. But you have to sow. And I want to deal more a bit about this principle of intention. Any farmer knows if you're going to adequately harvest or so, then you, and you're going to bring in a sizable crop, that it's going to mean labor. That's why the Bible says, you don't labor, you don't eat. You don't work, you don't eat. All right? It's a simple principle. A lot of people ignore it. We think the government will take care of us. Let the government take care of us. But the, the biblical principle is, if you're, going to, if you're going to have, if you really want to receive the first principle, is get out there and start laboring loading the pipe, whatever it takes in your particular industry, career, or life, you have to get out there and you have to do something. Every farmer knows if he just pulls up his tractor and watches the field day in and day out, if he never puts a seed in the ground, he's never going to get a harvest. You have to do something. And this is what 2 Corinthians 9 is talking about. You know, And you may say, well, Brother Joe, again, I'll say it again. I cannot afford to do it. I just can't afford it. Well, 2 Corinthians 9 says, He will supply seed to the sower. Bread for food. He'll also supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. In other words, we're giving in accordance to the will of God for our life. That's righteous deeds. And we're giving in a way that honors God. And we're giving with a heart that's right to God. God says, hey, I'll make sure you have seed to sow. I can't give. Why why can't you give? Well, I don't have any money. Why don't you have any money? You're violating some principle somewhere. Well, I'm on a limited income. Who cited that? Well, the government. I talked to my 87-year-old mother this morning. She said, you know, if I didn't know these principles, I'd starve to death. You know? If I didn't know these principles, I'd starve to death. And there's a lot of people probably who are starving today who, because not, not knowing the principle, are they ignoring the principles? You know, sometimes it's just our own ignorance. Ignorance is not knowing. Stupidity is not doing Amen. You want to harvest? You have to go. You have to step out. You have to plant. You have to labor. There's a, there's, a, there's a process that's involved here. So you can't say, well, I don't have any seed. God said, I'm giving you seed. What are you doing with the seed? Maybe you know, many years ago, the United States Commission of Indian Affairs sent a large shipment of seed to the Sioux Indian nation, and he told them to plant this seed for a harvest. And instead of planting the seed, they ate it. That's many, many years ago. They ate the seed. So guess what happens at harvest time? Nothing to eat. That's pretty reflective of a lot of Christians today. You've been eating what God gave you to plant. You have this idea that every time you get a raise or every time you get money or more money, it's to buy something new, to get something bigger, to have something better, something shinier. But that's the culture. That's where we're engineered in our culture, isn't it? 
If you really want to be happy, you have to have more. If you really want to be happy, you have to drive this car. If you want to be happy, you have to wear these name brand clothes. If you want to be happy, you've got to have these kind of sunglasses. If you want to be happy, you have to have, the, have this kind of suit or this kind of dress or those kind of shoes. And everybody puts names on products. And if you don't buy the name, then you certainly can't be happy. And people fall for it. In this room, people have fallen for that. And you kind of have the status thing you, you live by and you measure yourself by. And the Bible says when you measure yourself by any other means than God, you become foolish. You have to have this intention of saying, I realize that everything I've got has been given to me by God, and part of that is seed that I'm supposed to be sowing, not eating, not keeping. Well, I just can't afford to give. No, you don't realize the principle. It's not a matter of affording. You just said, I need to eat this right now. And the seed that was there for sowing has been eaten. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, hey, in this, this whole idea of intention, he says, hey, every one of you should do just as you purpose in your heart. In other words, there, he's calling for a decision. Don't do it grudgingly. Don't do it because the preacher preached on it, because, it's, it, because you, you felt under compulsion. You do it because you love God. You do it as a cheerful giver, excited to be a part of this whole process of reaping because you've sown. It's exciting to reap. It's exciting to sow when you understand what it's all about. Everybody likes to get, don't we? The Bible says more blessed to give. Why? Because that keeps the getting coming. But as others have said, we don't get, we don't give just so we can get something. We give something so we can get something because in the getting of something, there's some more seed for giving something. So we're giving to get, to give, to get, to give, to get. In other words, we become like a, a warehouse that's always being used, a, a barn that's being used by God to, to fulfill the needs of our life and to minister to the needs of other people. But what has to happen? There's this intentional mindset that you have to have that says, I'm going to be a part of what God says is the way to be a good steward of what he's given me and realize a portion of what he's given me is to be given away and planted. He says, so you make a decision, is what Paul's saying there. You decide. What am I deciding on? Well, the first aspect is, well, decide when you sow, you know, how, how are you going to sow? Are you going to sow, he says two things, are you going to sow sparingly or are you going to sow bountifully? Which one's it going to be? This morning as you sit and you think, I'm giving to the Lord today, then make your mind up. Praise the Lord, I'm going to give to the Lord and because he's blessed me and because he's given me seed. I want to be a good manager and I want to be used by God. And I know the way he uses me partly in my life is to give financially, money. Now, I know there's some people, I've heard preachers say, well, you know, Pastor Joe, uh, and preacher friends, I know, have told me this. You know, I tell my people to tithe, but I don't. I don't do that. I said, why don't you tithe at least 10%? And they said, well, you know, I, I give my service and time to the Lord. And because I do that, I don't do the other. I said, well, I guess you're getting real blessed in your time and your talent, but your treasure is suffering because you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. The principle of identity. So if you're not sowing in your finances, no wonder you're suffering. And no wonder you think you need your tithe to survive. Because you're ignoring what God said. That was the nicest way I put it to you all. I said a little more severe to him. <laughs> Called him something like a yellow belly, cheat and sneak and thief. But anyway, <laughs> that's between friends. You have to sow. Decide how you want to get it back. If you don't sow, you don't reap. If you sow a little, you get a little. If you sow a lot, you get a lot back. But the, God didn't, the scriptures doesn't stop there, and the Holy Spirit is, is inspiring this passage to the church today that needs to hear it and saying, listen, you give, you decide how you're going to give, a little or you're going to give a lot, and then when you do give, you do it with a cheerful heart, cheerful attitude, cheerful action. That's worship. Because that's really what it's all about, is it not? God has given me everything I, I've ever needed, and he has you too, whether you realize it or not. And he's given it to you, not only to bless you, but to be a blessing to other people as well. So here, here it is simply, here, here's the outline again. If you're going to reap, you have to do what? You have to sow. When you reap, you reap what it is you sow, identity. You reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. But when you sow, you sow intentionally with purpose and with joy and with cheerfulness as an act of worship. You know, there's only one way to get into this process for your life. You can't just hope and think, well, that's a good principle. I, I may pray. The Bible's talking about habitual lifestyles here. Occasionally, the offering comes. I hear an offering, I'll, tell, I'll give something then. You know, feed the orphans or whatever. I, I'll give something then. How do you really get in on, on God's economy, so to say, and in God's plan for your life? What's, what's the real way? If I really want to in, in, in be involved, and, and please let me, uh, let me just clearly say, this is one of the most measurable ways 
that you have as a man, as a woman, as a young person, even as a child and a teenager. This is a very measurable way. You say, what do you mean? In other words, if you'll just log this, say, well, okay, I gave a church this much money. And you just watch, and you just log how much you get back. And you just begin to log, write down the blessings that you're getting and the financial blessings that you're getting. It may come in different ways. It may be something that was saved you, something that was given you, something that just came out of the blue. But you'll see it. You write it down. And at the end of the year, I believe with all my heart, if you've had the intention of honoring God with your giving, all right, and doing it with a cheerful attitude, you'll be able to clearly see how when you load the pipe, a harvest came out the other end. God met the need, and not only did he meet the need, he increased your capacity to sow seeds at the end of it all. There's only one way to get in. It's a four-letter word. We'll use it. Give. 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 Jesus said it. Give, and it'll be given to you. Don't give. The obvious is understood. It won't be given to you. But if you give, and how does that take place? Well, I do believe it should start with a portion. I believe in biblical proportional giving. I think the Old Testament gives us a clear standard. We know in the New Testament we're not under law, we're under grace. But if you follow the law, I mean, at least this, if you do a study on tithe today, you'll see tithing was part of, of, of the people of God long before there was ever a law. I mean, you see Abraham tithing to Melchizedek. You see, obviously, Adam knew the principles. They made offerings, and, and they made grain offerings, and they made sacrificial, I mean, Cain and Abel, the whole battle was over the offering and what it was all about. Now, some people say, well, well, you know, one of the brothers brought a blood offering. That wasn't acceptable because the other guy, what, I mean, the blood offering was acceptable, but the grain offering the other guy brought wasn't any good. And so we had to accept, no, no. The Bible, when, when it gets down to the law, you can bring grain offerings. They were acceptable. But if you follow some of the early church fathers when they teach on tithing and look at some of those early sermons that have been recorded by those first century pastors in the churches, they said that issue with Adam and, and Adam's son, uh, Cain and Abel, was over the, the issue of the amount that was given, not what was given. So it was understood that there should be proportion. Even in the beginning, we should give a portion. Why? Because that's the seed, like the farmer. He gets a harvest, but he takes part of the harvest, and what's he do with it? It's seed to plant. So I believe that 10% is, is a good place to start. It's like baby giving, okay? But we're, we're maturing in Christ. Don't you want to get in the part of saying, I'm giving much more than 10%? You, you're just experiencing these principles? Yeah. I think an honorable goal was what R.G. Letourneau and J.C. Penney, some of these godly men of, of history, when they wrote in their memoirs, and you see in reading their biographies, they were strong Christian men. They supported missions all over the world. They, 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 they just did tremendous godly works. And their goal was, when those two men especially, they said, our desire is that we get to the place in our life where we're giving 90% and keeping 10%. Some of y'all's goals keep 99% and give one. <laughs> no, you got it all wrong. Why did God bless those men so magnificently? I believe because they understood this proportional mindset of giving and giving your tithes. Now, we've taught in our church that you should go beyond that. There has to be, you should graduate from kindergarten sooner or later in first grade, junior high. You start realizing, hey, I, I want to be a blessing. So we give beyond our tithe. We give perhaps, sometimes you base it on what you can afford. Well, I looked at my checkbook. I've looked at my savings. I looked at these things. I know what's needed. And, and this is something I can do above and beyond what I did there, and it's, it's something I could afford. But there's a third giving, and this is the giving that my wife and I learned right before we got married, about a year before we were married. I learned these principles, and it was called the principle of giving by revelation. Giving by revelation. And that's an exciting, exciting principle. And we understood, one, that you have to reap what you sow. But we started getting to the point point, say, Lord, we're going to give this particular amount already because we believe there's a standard in Scripture called a tithe. It's a good standard. It's a noble place to start. But we don't want to be stuck there in our life, so we want you to speak to our hearts and show us how we should give. And there's been times in our life, even as a young couple, to the present day today, when God just speaks to our heart through prayer time or some issue and, and comes, arises, and God just tells us we're supposed to give a very clear, a clear amount. We have these times like we do the Ford and Faith that we talk about every year at this time. We, we just pray, what do you want us to do, God? And, 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 and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And it's amazing what God will do when you ask. How He'll speak to your heart. How he, you just know that you know you know that you're supposed to do that. We, we've had, all of us that are Christians have had those experiences in our life, whether it's been about money or something. We just know what we're supposed to do. I mean, the Spirit of God just speaks to our heart and it becomes obvious what we're to do. And then we respond. God's just looking for folks he can trust. The Bible says faith in little master over much. I remember one of the first experiences I had with this. 
There's a man by the name of Manly Beasley. Great faith teacher of the Word of God, gone on to be with Jesus since. I remember I'd just probably been saved less than a year, working with my brother Phil, and Phil and I went and had lunch with Manly Beasley. Now, Phil and I are living in a house, single men, had a street ministry that Phil had started on the streets, bringing people into a little house. We had a garage that was taken in, seat about 60 people maybe. We'd bring in bands and bring in kids from off the street, and we'd, we'd do these gospel rallies, all right? We'd, we'd get up and preach the Word of God to them, share testimonies and do music and give invitations, making disciples and leading people to Christ and taking them out soul winning. We showed them how to be soul winners. So we're involved in this, but, you know, there's not a lot of income, a bunch of hippies. So evangelist set us down and said, guys, you need to learn this principle. This is what, what's gotten me through my life. And he's began to teach us these principles in another outline format. But it's the same thing. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. And you reap according to how you sow. But you need to sow. Well, our deal was, I think we might have eaten the seed because I don't have anything. <laughs> so we just decided to go home. Phil and I said, Dan, you know, we, we need to start giving. So we started going through the house and looking at our personal belongings. And we gave away shoes and shirts and Anything we could. We gave away some furniture. We started giving stuff. Now, our greatest need at that moment in time was a bigger place. We needed a bigger place to do the ministry that was growing. We were trying, we were trying to stick 100 kids, 120 kids in a room that holds 60 or 70, you know? And the cops were giving us fits in the community and everything else. And we were at the end of a dead-end street in a little community down in Deer Park, Pasadena area. So we started giving. Just said, we're going to trust the Lord, and He's going to meet our needs, and we'll just give what we can. All right? Just a couple of days, probably within 48 hours after that, that we started doing that, there was a knock on the door. I was in the living room, Phil went and answered the door and opened the door and there was this pastor there and he was the pastor of the local Fringe Church, that's the Quakers, all right, called the Fringe Church. And he, we walked into men and he sat down and he, just with teary eyes, he just said, I don't know, I just know that I'm supposed to be here. I want to meet you, I know what you guys are doing down here, I appreciate it. And many people in my church appreciate it. And, uh, I, you know, I... I don't know how to say this. We have, a, we have two buildings, and they're several miles apart, and we have one building that we just never use. Probably seats three or 400 people. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you don't need a building. Maybe you do need a building, but we're willing to give you this building. We were very carefully reserved and said something like, Hallelujah! <laughs> Thank you, Jesus! But there was such an important of that testing, try me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not. It was so clear. God said, I will. I do. I work. This is the method I work by. This is what I said in creation. Everything's going to bring after its own kind. You, if you want to receive from it, then you've got to give to it. That's the principle. And it works. And over, listen, I, I'll honestly tell you, folks, if it were not for that principle, this church would not be here today. If we're not for many of you in those early days of a church learning those principles very quick and very we just wouldn't be sitting here today as a fellowship. We've gone the way of so many others, like 90% of most churches that start fail within the first year or two. We'd have been in that group. But God continually has met the need abundantly over and above what we could think or ask. But it gets back to this, we'll be, we'll, we'll be revelation givers. Will we be revelation givers? I mean, in the first couple of years, we'd set aside, I think, $15,000, $20,000, or something like this. There's a lot of money for us. And within that first couple of years, God told us to give that money away to a young lady who was needing a transplant. I don't remember the amount of money, but it's all the money we had. And you glowingly agreed, said, let's just give it to that need and see what God does. As a result of that, here we sit today. God has been so good. This is living faith. Matthew 13, 58. What does it say in Matthew? It said, God did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. That was Jesus' hometown that was written about. He leaves town, they want to kill him, and he says, but he did not do many mighty works there. I don't want that to be written over my life, Matthew 13, 58. He didn't do much in Joe's life because he wouldn't believe God. You want that written in your life? He didn't do much in your life because you wouldn't believe it. I don't want it written over the church. He didn't do much at believers because they wouldn't believe. No, we want to believe God. And in our life and in our walk and in our families and in our children's life, we want to teach these principles. This is how you receive. I can do what he says. And I can do when he says to do it. And I can do how much he ever tells me to do it. Because I believe God. And so can you. And so can we as a people. And we've seen it demonstrated over and over again. I'll close with this last passage. It says in Luke 16, verses 10 through 13. He that's faithful 
in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, do you all know what mammon is, good King James word? Money, material things. Who's going to commit to your trust the true riches? If you've not been faithful in what's another man's, who's going to give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. He's going to love one, hate the other, or else he will hold to one and, and despise the other. You just can't serve God in money. Can't serve God in mammon. And, but this is the line that most Christians have struggled getting across. They say, I love God. Mark. It's like the song we just sang. You know, I just want to tell you, I love you, God. I love you. I want to say, I love you, Lord. But then, you know, how much do we love him? Do we love our mammon, our material goods? Do we think that every penny we got in the bank is for us to spend on something other that's going to perish in time and not make any difference? Oh, we understand these biblical principles. Hey, that's the true riches. Walking with God, seeing God move, experiencing God in your life, enjoying the things that God wants you to enjoy, being a part of His harvest of souls and lives and individuals. Are you a part of that? Are you believing God? Are you experiencing God in your life? There's only one way. It's that four-letter word. Give. Give. And it will be given. Not, we don't pervert that by the prosperity movement we've seen today. Give and it will be made rich. God may make you rich down the road. I don't know. That's up to Him. It's His business. But He will meet your needs and He will give you enough seed, so to say, to meet the needs of others. Amen. Now, if I were probably to give the most adequate New Testament invitation, I'd probably just put the offering boxes up here. <laughs> but you can do that on the way out as you leave today. Amen? Some of the pa one pastors, more than one, have asked me, you don't pass a plate? Why don't, why don't you pass an offering plate? If we don't pass an offering plate, number one, there's an Old Testament standard of offering boxes that when people would come into the temple and they would come in and they put their, what the member of the place Jesus stood over by the treasury, there was a place, about 12, 13 boxes, where people would come in and they'd place their gift to the Lord as an act of worship as they came and as they went. I believe that's the biblical way. One pastor said, well, Arms, you're really stupid because, you know, if you'd pass the plate, you'd probably collect 10% more. I said, why is that? Well, because, you know, nobody likes the plate to go by them when everybody's looking and not put something in. I said, yeah, we've dealt with those kind of people before. That's the guy who takes that $1 bill and folds it up in about 100 folds, you know, so nobody can tell if it's a 100 or a 1. And it takes the guys who count the money about 10 minutes to unfold it. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? One dollar. <laughs> Ka-ching! <laughs> it's not worth their time. <laughs> That's not what giving's about, is it? Right. It is joyful. So there ought to be an attitude that when you come in and you place money in those boxes and yours, you leave and you place money in those boxes, it's done with excitement. Hey, you're putting some seed in the ground. There's a universal, God-given principle that you reap what you sow. I'm sowing seed. God gave me sow seed, some for bread, some to sow, according to the Scriptures. I'm not going to eat my seed. I'm going to eat the bread. I'm going to sow the seed. God says, so there may be need to eat in my house, and needs may be met, and your joy can increase, and you get to see the blessing of God. I do believe there's a lot of people under a curse today because their finances are out of order. I believe the reality of Malachi 3 and that curse is just as real today as it was then. That stinginess invites a curse upon our life. And some of you will never make ends meet. No matter what you do, no matter how many times you switch that credit card to a lower rate. Amen? Juggle those things around. Always try to manipulate and maneuver and twist and make and finagle. Learn to be content with what God gives you first. And learn how to give. And then see what God does on your part. The Bible says, God said... I'll rebuke the devourer. That was a Bill Stafford who one time told us, he said, you know, uh, everybody tithes. Some people give it, some have it collected. <laughs> some of you may be in a collection process today. Things are hard. That's the simplicity of the message. Our part on that is just give, give faith, give cheerfully, give honorably. Amen. Let's bow our heads right there where you're seated. I'm not going to give an altar call this morning other than to your heart to say to respond to the Holy Spirit at this point to respond to God. If you are here without Christ, this message has such a clear, clear picture of God's love. The Bible said, for God so loved he gave. He didn't give a cheap gift. 
didn't give sparingly, he gave bountifully. We read that verse from 2 Corinthians, thank be to God for his unspeakable gift. You just can't fathom how glorious and great the gift is. And he gave his son so that many sons, the scripture says, would come to him. He practiced the principle. And now the family of God has many, many, many sons in it. Give your heart to Jesus today. More than your wallet, he's concerned with that internal part of your life, your soul, your very being. Give your life to Christ. You leave this today.